Hey, Lambly. I heard the diva was talking to Oprah. Okay, let's get to it. It's more than a statement. It's a way. Let's see what this whole interview is about. I'm excited for this book. Y'all already know I got it on pre-order. Yes, yes. All right, let's go. Let's hear what the elusive Chanteuse has to say. Let's go. Of the last four decades. After graduating high school in 1987, Mariah immediately moved to Manhattan to pursue her lifelong dream of singing. She worked as a coach at Girl before landing a gig as a backup singer for Bryn K. Starr, who introduced Mariah to then-president of Sony Music, Tommy Mottola. He helped launch her career and would later become her first husband. Mariah now has a record 19 number one singles. That's more than Elvis Presley, y'all. And she's close to tying the Beatles, who have just one more. More than Elvis Presley, you mean more than Michael Jackson, Oprah? Let's go! Dramatic childhood had on her life. Well, I have to say, uh, it's great to see you. You look gorgeous. You look so beautiful. And you've been staying at home. How are you and your family doing with all this? We're doing as well as can be expected, you know what I mean? For the kids, um, it was important that they had a summer, but they're doing good. Well, that's the most important thing. And we see from TikTok that you're keeping a lot of fun. Me and Mariah, go back like baby the past fly. <laughs> Mommy, I you said do the high notes. And, Super cute. And they're enjoying it, and you're enjoying, you know, entertaining them. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> You know, it's hard for me to believe, uh, as I started preparing for this interview, looking back at old tapes of us. Yes, I think this you my, look good. Tenth interview, you have to have like nine interviews over the years. I didn't think we talked about things like that. No, but I mean like, like oh, man. Oh, okay. That's what I did. I put everything I had gone through into writing of these songs. I didn't look like one particular group or another. Please welcome Mariah Carey. I first met you nearly 30 years ago when you were just, you were, you were 21 years old, your first appearance on the Oprah show. And, and I have to tell you, I could feel then, as could the audience, that you were destined not just for stardom, but for some kind of superstardom. And now that you're in that league of legends that we know by just one name, like... Whitney, like Beyonce, like Aretha, and like, you're almost yeah. aspiring to somewhat be somewhere close in the vicinity of like Oprah. That's, uh, that's the goal. That. Well, thank you. So let's talk about this book. Whoa. It's called The Meaning of Mariah Carey, and you can get it just a tap of your finger on Apple Books right now. So by the time I finish the next paragraph, you could have it downloaded. I think you went all the way there. It's it's heartbreaking. It's vulnerable, but also very inspiring, I will say, because it shows that you never, ever, ever gave up on yourself. And I'm telling you, I finished this and I so, the, the, the meaning Mariah is a really good title because I, I, I now really get you. I so understand so yeah, I can't even front, right? I know on IG, they was roasting Oprah for her wig. <laughs> but Mariah looked good, though. Let's go. <laughs> I understand that, you know, out of those nine interviews, and often I had the sense that there was something beneath the surface of the beautiful facade, which I never... Did Oprah really sense this? Like, Oprah took me out. She always tried to go like this deep. Like, Oprah, did you ever real sense this back then? I rose. <laughs> was so beautiful, by the way. I, I, yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. Yeah. That too. We'll get to that. But what I felt was a kind of, um, I don't know, I couldn't articulate it, a sadness or loneliness um, that you were not ready to reveal. I particularly felt that on a show that we were doing with your mother uh, when we we're talking about racial issues. But in your introduction, you say this. I 
shady editor. Y'all see the clip they put of Mariah? Like she roll her eyes or something. <laughs> Offer this book in large part to finally emancipate that scared little girl inside of me. It's time to give her a voice, to let her tell her story exactly as she experienced it. So why now? Why was it finally time to do that? To be well, emancipated? To have held on to my inner child was really important to me ever since I was a child. And I realized one day when I grow up and I do what I'm dreaming of doing, which will happen, and I won't. We already know Mimi been emancipated. She's been on this journey of emancipation. So this ain't something that just sprung up now. She always been trying to free Mimi. Let's go. In these sad circumstances forever. But, you know, one day I'm going to, I'm just going to remember what this feels like so I don't turn into one of those people that um, has lost touch with the essence of who they are. But I really did in so many ways because of so many other outside components. So having the time to reflect on my life um, and to be able to explain things in a layered way that with the complexities that there are has been really uh, a motivating factor and also it's been very therapeutic to do this so I feel like it was supposed to be happening now at this time and that's my view on most things that because faith yeah. is so is it happening yeah it's yeah. happening because it's, it's happening and supposed it is, to be happening yeah so let me ask you this were you um, afraid of writing the book for a long time because of what your family and other people would think and is that what has caused it to be such a long process to actually get it done. For a long time, were you afraid to say the things that you now are saying in this well, moment? Well, yes, um, it, but it's not because I was worried about what they would think. It's because I would never have spoken a word about anybody in my life and I tried to be very fair um, see that's what I always love about Mariah Mariah keep it 100 she's solid right she like I'm not trying to put these people dirty laundry out there you know what I'm saying that's not me but she like y'all forcing my hand oh let me tell my story I'm, I'm with you Mariah let's go but people have drawn first blood with me historically you know as I know you understand this you know when when there are people that are you know, in any way connected to you as a person that achieves a certain level of success, you are a target, you're vulnerable, but I wouldn't have gone here if things hadn't been done to me, if I hadn't been dragged by certain people and treated as an ATM machine with a wig on. Like, it's like, all it is is like, let me get some money and let me get some money at no matter what. Like, even if that means going to a tabloid, which as we have discussed, they don't even have any importance anymore, but you know, when they did, going, you know, I, I want whatever, X amount of thousands, and I'll tell you some salacious story about, you know, yeah, my. Been there. Yeah. Been there. I know. Been there. And it's also sad when your own family is, you know, I've had my own family trying to sell me out for, you know, $10,000 when you've already provided them with thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So I understand that. But I wanted to yeah. say this. I think your fans, I think the lambs are going to love this book because <laughs> uh, we discovered the origins of so many of your songs, so many written out of you pain and and chaos and i will say this that in all the years yeah i'm so ready like i ordered that hard copy prime let's go september 28th let, let's let's get this and i know what kind of piano right to put in my house boom <laughs> goes <laughs> let's go and the other interviews that i've done with you i don't think i've ever heard you tell the story that you tell early on in the book mm -hmm. It's on page six, actually. Of Y'all see that piano? What's that? How you pronounce that? Petroth? I just know goals for my life. Like, boom, I'm aspiring to get a Petroth grand piano up in my house. <laughs> Let's go. Little friend Maureen mm -hmm. heard you sing and told you it sounds like there's music with your voice when you sing. Mm -hmm. Tell us that story. Yeah, so we were walking down the street. And I, that's why I still remember her name. That's her real name. When we were walking together, like, really, yeah. I don't know, second grade, 
um, first grade, you know, really young. And I started singing and she literally stopped and stared at me and said, when you sing, it sounds like there's music with you. And it was a wonderful moment that I'll never forget. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I love it how you say she said it like a proclamation. She said, when you sing, it sounds like they're instruments with you. There's music all around your voice. And you write, she said it like a proclamation. Almost, Almost like a prayer. Like a prayer. They say God speaks through people, and I'll always be grateful for my little girlfriend speaking into my heart that day. She saw something special in me and gave it words, and I believed her. I believed my voice was made of instruments, piano, strings, and flutes. I believed my voice could be music. All I needed was someone to see and hear me. Uh, I think of that as just such a truly life-affirming moment, and it speaks to me how other people can be your angels and don't even know it. That moment of some outside of like my immediate circle being like, recognizing that there was something special about uh, me singing, it struck a chord with me. And you know why I, why it, that moved me so? Because it was just a stranger and it was a little girl, so it wasn't somebody who was trying to get something from, from you. And you lived in a world where you could actually not be seen, which makes me really want to tear up that you lived, that a gorgeous girl like yourself with a sweet heart like yourself grew up in a world, in a family where you could not be seen. And so for anybody outside to see you, I know what that means. Now y'all see that's that's really touching Mariah. Like she's like she about to start crying right now. Like oh for real, you just never know what people be going through. Because I, I I I grew up that way too. So so for me it was like a teacher who saw me. And I remember the first time a teacher said to me, "You're smart." How much that meant to me, and I why I love school so much because that was the place where I felt valued and for you the place where you felt valued is being able to make music and that's why that Maureen would make such an impression because if you're in a world where you could not be seen mm -hmm. then anybody who sees you validates you right right and to be seen and heard is like all of our I think everybody's need especially now it's like everybody's seen and everybody can be heard with social media it's such a different day but back then you really did need somebody to do, be that teacher that, that validated your existence. For, yeah. for me, that's how I always I say, like, something to validate my existence because I literally, that's why that ex after existence, I literally didn't feel like I was worthy of existing. And that's something that's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. You know what I mean? Like, I, I get I it. But let me tell yet. you. No, no, don't hate saying it. You know what? <laughs> the reason... You didn't feel like existing. It's so very clear here mm -hmm. in the meaning of Mariah because we learn in this book that your life was defined by trauma. And the reason why I feel that this memoir is so important is because the world looks at a person like you who apparently has all the things. You have the looks, you have the homes, you have the money, you have the fame, and they... Th See, Mariah is real humble, y'all. Again, don't let that grand diva in this fool, y'all. Like, you could, you could still tell she's still very insecure and humble. And really, to me, that makes her even more enduring. But again, just because, you know, we think these celebrities got everything, that don't necessarily mean they happy. Let's go. Think, oh... That's what makes you worthy. That's what makes you valuable. And yet, you prove in your writing of this memoir that it takes a lifetime of work to get to worthiness when you have been raised in trauma. And so I think understanding how traumatic your life was, the loneliness and sadness behind the facade that you carried for so, so long, I now understand it because the number one reason I, I, I now understand that people keep repeating past behaviors and behaving from their pain is because of the trauma. And so what I've learned is that when people are acting out, even kids, early on, and people say, what's wrong with that kid? That kind of kid's so many behave. Why they have that? That the real question that people should be asking is what happened to that kid. Yes. So it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. Mm -hmm. And so you lead us into 
the trauma that basically defined your life. Mariah's father, Alfred Roy Carey, was of African-American and Venezuelan descent and grew up in New York. Mariah's mother, Patricia, is an Irish-American from Illinois. Alfred and Patricia married in 1960. Alfred was an aeronautical engineer. Patricia was an opera singer and vocal coach. Together, they had three children, the youngest, Mariah, and her two older siblings, Allison and Morgan. Alfred and Patricia divorced when Mariah was three years old. Grew up in a house where you're constantly afraid and you were able to figure out, literally as a little kid, sense when the violence was coming, right? Yeah, that was a thing. And it described, you know, through the kind of the feeling of when it's a storm that's about to happen and it's weather, it's, you know what I mean? It's a scary thing, but you sense it. And you learn to navigate your behavior because of it. And you've been traumatized your whole life. You raised in a family of chaos. Can you just sort of summarize? You had a brother who would, was enraged. Extremely and, violent, yes. And unpredictably so. So the thing when you're living in an environment where you don't know where it's going to come from, you're always constantly walking on eggshells in a mm -hmm. state of anxiety yourself. And a sister who... I don't know. How would you describe your sister? I would say troubled. I, I would say traumatized. Um, and I, I try to be thoughtful about that. Although I don't know if the same courtesy has been extended to me from anybody that mm -hmm. <laughs> that caused certain traumatic events in my life. Right. But, but you write at length uh, in, in The Meaning of Mariah about your brother and sister. And one of the yes. things that you say, and there's too much to try to cover here. That's why there's... <laughs> Then y'all see Mariah is very uncomfortable talking about her family, her childhood. She get fidgety. She's moving her hair a lot. Mm, so sad. We're not going to get it in an interview. But I'll read this short passage. You say, through the years, both my sister and brother have put me on the chopping block. Sold lies to any gossip rag or trashy website that would buy or listen. They have attacked me for decades, you write. And you say, but when I was 12 years old, my... Then y'all say I'm right, just look when Oprah said they've attacked me for years. You mean the book, like this lady is still hurt, still traumatized. And this is just so sad, man. Sister, this was a story. My sister drugged me with Valium, offered what? me a pinky nail full of cocaine, and what? inflicted me with third degree burns and tried to sell me out to Whoa. a pimp. And Yo, this sister is trash. How you gonna do that to let alone another human being but to your little baby sister? Man, trash, throw away, get up out of here. Like Mariah said, get the fuck out. <laughs> now you know that there was a lot of pain going on with them also. What do you think was the source of their pain? We don't even really know each other. And that's the thing. When they were out there and telling and selling stories, I'm like, but you guys, we didn't grow up together, but we did. Like, they were on their journeys. By the time I got into the world, you know, they had already been damaged. I get what she mean, because, like, she's so much younger than them. Like, by the time she was born, them folks was halfway out the house, either out the house. I get it my opinion but again i wasn't there i, I was i was dropped into this world and i said like I, I literally felt like an outsider amongst my own family because of the way that and they resented you because of the color of your skin right because they were also biracial but you were lighter and they felt like you were passing i, I think what? they definitely always felt like i was passing we we're not even that far apart tonally like that's my thing they just grew up with the experience Mm -mm. See y'all, this again is going back to that slavery stuff again. Like when people say, oh, slavery don't matter. Slavery is so deep rooted even in any black family, right? Here you have this mixed race, race family, but shoot, colorist issues happening. Oh, you know, you light skin, you getting treated better than us. You look white, you getting treated better than us. And Mariah, like, shoot, I feel like we all look the same, you know what I mean? It's crazy. Of living with a black father and a white mother together as a family, and I was, for the most part, living with my mother, which they saw as easier, but in reality, it was not. To them, it was easier, and I, and I think, you know, there's many reasons why, but 
they have always thought that my life was easy, but they also always looked for a, 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 I don't know what the name of it is, but it's like a get rich quick scheme or like, what can we do for today? Or like the world owes me something. You know, I've been having a lot of conversations on Apple TV Plus about how racial inequality has impacted generation upon generation. My latest book club selection cast by Isabel Wilkerson reveals how oppression was purposely woven into the laws and into our culture. And while I was reading the meaning of Mariah. So first of all, systemic racism is real guys. And I need to check out that book. And my last point is, unfortunately y'all, you know what I mean? I hate to be like a Debbie Downer, but this family is never going to be straight because I, when, when you have issues that deep rooted, right? That's like, whoa, colorism and I feel like you you feel like you better than me like stuff like that. it just don't go away there is nothing literally there's nothing Mariah can do or say to make them folks feel better and the opposite right there is nothing literally that they can say to her either you know what I mean it's just like one of them things where unfortunately this is just gonna have to always be a chip on her shoulder I was so struck by how you described your father's life and his struggle to find his place in the world. You actually use the word cast several times in the book. So I wanna know, do you think his life experiences, even before you were born, had an mm -hmm. impact on you? And if so, how? Well, I definitely feel like my father felt like an outsider in many ways. That was sort of maybe where we didn't connect early on because I didn't understand the strictness and I talk about that like when he because it was an almost military approach to life and then we talk about his experience in the military which is intense um and what you know he revealed to me and we we had a lot of discussions when he was on his deathbed and that was a time when I felt I just wanted him to know like however anything we ever went through or our disconnect or whatever happened and whoever we want to blame that on like it was never his fault and that was an important part for me well um, when i read when i read this well i'm glad she got the time to kind of get some healing from her daddy i mean that's good and like i said man the family just family strife is just wow it, again like everybody's story begins at home like what happens to you in your childhood impacts the rest of your life like seriously when i read that your father you know is accused of raping a white woman, white woman. yeah dang yeah i mean what? Emmett Till and so many others are dead based, based upon that and the fact that your father was freed and was able to go on with his life doesn't right. mean he isn't forever forever traumatized by that and tra yeah. traumatized by that yeah one of the more memorable stories for me is when uh, you can remind me of how old you were. You go to your father's house with your new friend, your new little friend. Was his mm -hmm. friend Becky? Yes, her real name. That's her Becky. real name. It's her real name. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That you had made this new friend Becky, and you're having a play date, and your mother takes you both and drops you off at your father's house. And, and now you pick up the story from there. Tell us what happened when your white mother dropped the two of you off at your black father's house. And Becky's white, too. Okay, yes. <laughs> Becky was a beautiful strawberry blonde girl with freckles. And I thought, oh, this is what little girls are supposed to look like, I guess. So we get to my father's house. My father comes to the door. And we both look up. My mother was lingering in the car, um, which was not typical. But anyway, so we... We get there and he opens the door and he's like, hi, I'm Mariah, which is how he always greeted me. And she was frozen and stared at him with her jaw, her jaw dropped and she burst into tears. And what? I realized, oh my gosh, she is scared of my father. And he's also a very tall man and to me, a very beautiful man. And, but in her eyes, I think whatever she heard in her house, as a child growing up in an all-white community and with parents that have their own views, she was scared when she saw my father. So my mother whisked her away back into the car and me and my father just never talked about it. But it was such a defining moment for me in terms of like, I am so different than everybody else. 
around me for so many reasons. Y'all, okay, wow. Again, this is crazy. So first of all, first of all, I'm not trusting this mama, right? So I'm sorry. Mariah said the lady never lingered around, but just so happy when you bring little Becky, you want to linger around today. So did the mom purposefully do this? Was she trying to send a message to the daddy? Like, see, this is why we can't be together. Look how little white kids react toward you. And then, not only that, I'm sorry. I don't care if she is a child. There is no reason. This is unacceptable for a person, a little child, anybody to start crying because I don't look like you. We don't look like each other. Like, you crying out of fear? That is crazy. And you know that had to hurt that man. And you know that hurt Mariah too. Like, wow, I'm sorry, y'all. This is, this book is good. And I think it opens up just that conversation again where we talk about um, just colorism and not only that, racism and family issues. Like, man, wow. Like, that's crazy. Oh, and then you had a harrowing moment. I couldn't tell if you were in middle school or high school when a group of girls we were, in were junior brutally high. assaulted in junior high, oh, junior high, the worst. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Isn't it? <laughs> assaulted by a group of white girls in your class. Tell us about what, what happened then. One time, a group of girls, you know, happened to lure me off into the middle of nowhere and then pounce and then chant. You were with your friends. They get you in a secluded space. And then one of them yells out, you are a, and calls you the N-word. And then they all start wow, one at a time cool. yelling that that's what you are. I yeah. can't even imagine how angry and devastating that would make you feel. First of all, you thought these girls were your friend. They get you off to the side so that they can do that. They all have planned it, as you know mean girls do. They, had all, they all knew that that's what they were going to do ahead of time. And how, how do you then walk out of the space with your head up? Well, I couldn't because I had actually taken a long, an hour or two hour car ride with these girls up into a secluded area in, in, in this house in the middle of the Hamptons. And then it's an all white living room there and it's an all, and it's an all white and it's a whole thing. And who, there was nobody there to intervene. The adults didn't intervene. You know, if anything, who knows if they knew about it? I mean, it, I was I was stuck there, and I just had to deal with it. I, I cried, and I sat there, and I internalized it for years and years and years. And I just, it was never about, let me tell this story from my past in an interview. Why? How would it be relevant? You know what I mean? I had to get past that town, those girls, that moment. I had to get past it as a, as a person. So it's like... This this moment in history is so unique, but it, this is not new to us. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You know, success is always the best revenge. Yo, y'all, I didn't even know Mariah Carey, like, went through this in her childhood, right? I had seen this documentary on Reels, and they were basically talking about how her mom really was like, Mariah... I want you to pass and it was one girl I think she was like a classmate she was like she didn't even know Mariah was black until Mariah got a record deal but the crazy thing about these stories is again racism y'all it starts early right so when people say oh they say racist stuff like these celebrities we finally say racist stuff you know of any race not just black people but anybody and then they're like oh i was a kid i'm sorry y'all that's not an excuse for me that is not like you know it's dumb girls knew exactly what they was doing to her that junk still lives with that woman so i don't care how old you are you know right from wrong and again people know that, that they knew that was wrong that's why they cornered her got her to a secluded place to do that they didn't do that at that school because they already knew that was wrong like yeah this has got me hot I'm, Isabel Wilkerson shared with me the other day when we were interviewing her for cast that success is not only revenge success is the ultimate resistance which I love that I never yes, thought of it that way before that success is the ultimate resistance and later you tell the story of go but let me just say this about success too it's kind of like yeah that's true right it's the ultimate revenge but really it's that bittersweet because again that still weighs on that woman's heart to this day like 
30, 40 some years later. You know what I mean? That's something she will never forget. Like, that's messed up, man. We should really think about what we're saying before we say it. You know what I mean? And again, parents, if y'all got some kids out there, teach this. First of all, if y'all racist, stop being racist. <laughs> Number one. Number two, teach your kids. Man, that is not cool. Back to that girl's house. Mm -hmm. Pulling up and standing outside this is many years later when you are mariah and she is there and other people are coming out of that house and she gets to see that the woman that she was calling the n-word is now and also i, I said Harry. that the mulatto bitch from down the street is exactly how I explained it. And we don't encourage yeah. anybody to say that word because we know that it stems from slavery and it's not okay. Preach, Mariah. It, it's not okay to use that word either. It ain't cool. It ain't cool. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about. Boo, I like her as an artist, but I do wish she would change her name. <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. All right, let's go. I said it in that moment because that's how they viewed me. And so that's how I viewed myself. And that's a horrible place to be. But writing about it hopefully helps someone else. I think a lot of people are going to be helped by what you've written. And you know what is interesting to me? As a brown-skinned girl looking at you, growing up looking at women who look like you with long, pretty hair, uh, and envying that. And for you, your hair, the curly locks, the golden curly locks, was a bane of existence for you. It was um, a flaw in your identity for yourself. On, on, yes, and on both sides of the spectrum, because it wasn't that I didn't like my hair when it was behaving, but as I <laughs> grew up a little bit, it went from baby hair to like matted, unruly hair that nobody was combing through or understanding that you can't have a little girl running around with mats in her head. My mother didn't need conditioner or cream rinse as we called it back then like she didn't need that she had perfect hair but i guess she didn't understand how to handle it or what so on both sides of the spectrum i feel like i was hated on by certain people in my family for having the lighter hair and but then if they only realized like no actually i have like matted hair which is frizzy and curly and like it could look good if we had some conditioner so your no. mother didn't know what to do with it and many times she just let it go and so you were one of those little girls walking around with your hair not combed <laughs> and right and then it's like when are we gonna do something about this child's hair like i said when my father's half sisters went and tried to you know use a straightening what? comb yes and it was just not it just didn't work and it burned off a piece of my hair and then they realized like they were like sorry and it just didn't happen that day but at least they tried <laughs> what was your Wow, wow, wow. Again, a lot, a lot of discussion points that could happen from just this interview right now, right? First of all, shout out to them black aunties, okay? At least, like what Ryan said, they tried. And that's my thing, too. You know what I mean? Like, love is love. Love who you want to love. But again, if you're going to have biracial children, right? Especially black children, right? If you are not black, please understand before even having that child, you know what I'm saying, how to do their hair. That's why, I, again, I'm going to shout out Kim Kardashian because at least, and Chloe too, because at least they be, they, they, they know how to do their daughter's hair, right? They, they took the time to learn how to do it, right? Again, you got to understand, if you have biracial children, they're going to be different from you, you know what I mean? Because they have mixed genes, you understand what I'm saying? And so sometimes, you know... Uh, the black side can come out a little bit more and again like to me that's trash man this mom is trash like where are you with your daughter getting drugged up drugged out about to be pimped out um you let your daughter rock around here with matted hair looking crazy uh, this mom trash throw her in the, in the bin too get the fuck out let's go thought when essence magazine had on their cover the most misunderstood black woman in america i actually felt like it was a huge compliment because certainly at that time i felt like it was uh very true and something people in the mainstream weren't um aware of per se and there are a lot of people who didn't even know you were black a lot of people and this is so many years in but y'all that's so true like i have some friends even this day they swear me up and down like oh i'm right not black i'm like yes yeah, she is yes <laughs> like it's crazy but again 
I mean, that's that whole tragic mulatto thing, right? It, it's crazy history, as they always say, it repeats itself. But again, Mariah, not, not tragic, right? She persevering. Let's go. How many times can you just say it over and over? You know, we know that the one drop rule exists and we know why all these things exist and it does stem from that caste system of you know when of us as a people and the dilution and all the things that happen did you ever feel that you had to prove your blackness <laughs> uh a few times i've i look that's a thing that's very specific for everybody and i feel like you've yes you certainly had to deal with that. Yep. And also, I do get it. When we rise above our circumstances, it does create a, a different layer of privilege. And I do get it that, like, lightness in some people's mind is such a, an attribute. But actually, it's not what some people would think it is. My situation has just made me feel like an outcast. It just made me feel like I didn't have a specific tribe to back me up, except for a few instances in my life where I did, and then that kind of became something that gave me strength. You say that your mother was a paradox. She exposed you to art, to beauty and culture, but you say she also neglected you, and you write, it's taken me a lifetime, you say, to find the courage to confront the stark duality of my mother, the beauty and the beast that coexist in one person. How would you describe the neglect? Well, I think it's really a tough job to be a mother. So that said, because I know how I feel, I'm always like, oh no, if I don't do this right, I don't want their memory to be like, I didn't do the best that I could. Like I'm, I literally try to make their my kids lives amazing like how i would want things to be but we all make mistakes i would say the neglect was on several levels i always felt dirty i didn't feel put together leaving me with people that were not safe and also being one of those people that wasn't always um safe for me either emotionally the bottom line for me as i was I get y'all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This mom is trash. Like, what? Well, my heart go out to her because, I mean, everybody, I think everybody went to school with some kids who look raggedy. You know what I'm saying? And as children, we don't understand, like, it's not their fault, you know, because a, a child can't take care of themselves. And, yo, that's just, that's messed up, man. That's messed up. Yes. Um, it struck me to the core because it was also true of my mother. And I know a lot of you are watching have had the same experience. Um, you say your mother didn't know you. Your mother didn't know you. Uh, and one of the saddest things, uh, you know, my mother passed away a couple of years ago. And I received a beautiful message from uh, the writer, writer uh, Glennon Doyle when my mother passed and she said now that she's gone she can finally see who you were wow now that she's gone she can finally see who you were mm -hmm. and as i was reading this i was thinking i hope that it doesn't take that for your mother to finally see who you are <laughs> so that sign that aisle to the side that means listen this lady i'm 50 years old this lady don't know me right if she don't know me now she's not ever gonna know me i'm sorry y'all i'm sorry but i just feel like it's just too much time to pass that lady stuck in her ways mariah is never going to get that kind of motherly love that she craved she just i don't see that happening but uh, i don't know maybe y'all got some success stories out there but let's go <laughs> So what is your relationship like with her today? Do you still not feel seen? Yeah, I mean, it's really difficult. I'll always take care of her. Um, you know, there's been a, a huge role reversal in our relationship <laughs> since the beginning. And since I first started, I've been that go-to person, the matriarch for everyone, even as like the youngest child in the family. So I know you can understand what I'm saying, but not everybody gets it. That's a lot of pressure. Because also with that, with the expectations come 
resentment as well or envy you know what i mean it, it becomes like well she thinks she can have everything but you know by the way what can we get from her you know like it's it's really a tough place to be so my hope is that you know she, she sees the essence of me as as a good person and someone that's tried but we've been through a lot and that's why i describe that there is this duality um and by the way i'm not perfect nobody's perfect but it, it, in a relationship where you just want it to be a safe place, it's tough when it's not always that. So I, I love... I mean, and that's for real, right? I feel like everybody, that's what you want your parents to be. You want to be able to just, oh, let me go to my parents. But unfortunately, you know what I'm saying? Everybody don't have, like, the best parents like that. And like she said, her mom really be triggering her, which is just totally sad. And not only that, again, when your parents start looking for you for money, that is crazy because, again, it's kind of like, well, am I your child? Like, is this unconditional love or is this love, you know, contingent on my paycheck? Man, that's crazy. You write um, when you say, I don't think many people could recognize the pressure. You, you talk about this in the book. You say, I don't think many people could recognize the pressure to have so many people living off of you counting on you and pushing you to work and constantly work and work to sing and smile to dress up and twirl fly and write and work and work she had no concept of the humiliation i was suffering from the ravenous media monster that was feeding off of me she couldn't imagine how wounded and hunted i felt my mother could never acknowledge my fears in fact she often triggered them terrible terrible because just going to a place that is so laden with guilt and um just the layers of like you want that you want unconditional love from someone in that position you want like you you make these you want to be seen you want yeah. to be seen and you want the, for who you are yeah not for the atm card not for the atm card and also not just like Am I here? Am I put together? Am I taking care of your needs? It's like you want someone to say that to you sometimes. It's taken me so long to stop apologizing for myself constantly. And it is a reoccurring thing. But I think that's because I never felt seen or heard and I never felt safe. That's one thing like when I started studying acting, like learning to just even relax, just even relax that tension of being like in fight mode constantly. That just it always just was. After signing a record-breaking $100 million contract with Virgin Records and a whirlwind tour to promote her first feature film, Glitter, the pressures of success and the grueling pace of Mariah's relentless schedule took its toll. Emotionally and physically exhausted in July 2001, Mariah sought refuge at her mother's house. After a confrontation, Mariah's mother called 911 and police took Mariah to a facility. Two months later, Glitter became a commercial and critical failure. The first of Mariah's career. You know, uh, the story that you tell when you were at your mother's house, a home that you had bought for her, mm -hmm. and you were having an emotional crisis. Mm -hmm. You hadn't slept in six days. Everybody was pressuring you. I can't remember if you were supposed to finish an album or do something. It was the glitter, the whole glitter debacle. It was the glitter. It was the whole glitter thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so you'd gone to your mother's house and you are frantically washing the dishes and trying to do something to remove yourself from all the pressure. And your mother uh, became upset with you and called the police. Can you describe that? I mean, it was such a cast moment. I, I mean, it was... So first of all, again, what Mariah, it seems like what she was seeking was that safe space that she always wanted from her mom, but she should have known better, right? History had already told her, like, girl, your mama be tripping. Second of all, boom, your mama, I'm sorry, I hope I don't offend anybody when I, I hope I don't offend anybody when I say this, but sound like the mama being the Karen. Why are you calling the police on your child? Like... I'm confused when Mariah about to shoot you or something. If not, I'm, I'm talking about it's just not cool to call the police. Not only that, your daughter being famous. So now you're about to 
humiliate your daughter up in the press yo this is crazy and i just hope and pray this wasn't no type of money grab where she was trying to put mariah under a conservatorship like britney free britney like britney is you know what i mean like dang for real these parents be grimy touch your mother calls the police in a house that you have paid for you're mariah carey and the police come in and tell us what happened the bottom line is there was a code switching that happened and oh, a, a shift <laughs> in a power shift that was immediate. Code switching. Uh, clearly. So mom really turned into a Karen as soon as that door opened. That's what I'm getting from her saying code switching. I mean, y'all let me know. What, what y'all think she meant when she said that? Like, huh? <laughs> it was immediate and she was in charge. And rather than say, you know what, we're okay you know, I'm here, I'm taking care of my daughter, she's tired, you know, somebody called the cops by mistake and whatever. It was like, oh no, because you defied me, this is what's going to happen. And they took you off. The police took you, Mariah Carey. Yeah, 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 but I allowed myself car. to go. In the back seat of the police car, I, it's a vivid memory that I'll never forget. And it's, um, I have never spoken about it. But I, I just think it's important to say that at that moment, that seemed like a better alternative than where I was. In that moment wow. with her and with my ex-brother sitting on the floor in the quote-unquote Irish room. Yeah. Whoa, so what subtle shade, subtle this, quote-unquote Irish room? What is that about, right? I mean, is the mom, again, practicing racism within her own family? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or is this supposed to be a room to like, hey, I want y'all to embrace y'all our side. But again, it's all about how you do it, right? Shoot, y'all, this mama, now, again, she is the reason for a lot of Mariah's issues, man. It, not even Mariah, all her children. And even to maybe the the hate that they have for Mariah could have stemmed from, again, how the mama treated Mariah versus how she treated them. Maybe the older siblings, like, dang, if she was neglecting Mariah, they might be like, dang, she was really not caring about us because Mariah, we're a little darker than you. You know what I mean? Like, this is sad, man. So I know you've worked through, I thought that was interesting, because uh, I've never had therapy. I've always, I've done all my therapy on the TV show with all the experts <laughs> and right. other people's stories. But I thought, oh, gee, if I'd had a therapist like you, I probably could have gotten to that. Um, separation of people who are using you a lot sooner and you finally reached a point with your therapist where you no longer refer to your mother as mother you call her Patricia and you refer to your brother as your ex-brother and your sister as your ex dang I caught that ex-brother thing and sure I would call her by her first name too cause I'm talking about and like the lady that done her wrong her whole life and for you I'm sorry I mean everybody know we keep it you know 100 right you're not calling the police on your family unless for real they about to try to shoot you or stab you or something like that right why even get law enforcement involved where there is no need the only thing mariah wanted to do was to just chill at her mama house be herself right get some sleep that's that's what the lady needed some sleep right and again the mama if you in contact with me you know i'm working you know i'm out here breaking my butt off i'll tell you i'm tired only thing i'm just trying to do is chill and so okay if i start to just lose a little bit when i watch these dishes like just having a little break there i just need for your your motherly embrace right tell me it's gonna be okay you know what i'm saying i don't need for you to further traumatize me by having me put in some handcuffs in the back of a police car man get up out of here trash Mister. So in the book, when you write that your family was trying to have you committed to a facility, you write that because <laughs> you recognize uh, what the... Man, these folks were trying to Britney Jean, Mariah Carey, y'all. They were trying to get Mariah locked up, declare unstable, insane, whatever they declared Britney, whatever they trying to declare Kanye, right? Get these folks locked up so they can get control of that bank. That is dirty, man. I can't even trust family. Ugh. Trying to do, right? Right. Well, I recognize it afterwards because I realized I had no business being pressured that much. Nobody should ever have pressured anybody. But as we've seen in this inter in entertainment industry, it happens and it doesn't just happen to one person. People push artists to the edge and then they wonder why most people are gone too soon. 
you know, and then we had this culture of the paparazzi being like vultures, as we were talking about earlier. But it's just indicative of my family, sorry, but it's indicative of the nature of kind of like the beast is like, oh, here's a scam, here's a scheme, you know, like, let's make this happen in order to make unlimited money and resources for ourselves rather than have her make this huge deal and be in control of it. Why not just, like, take it over? No. Were you in breakdown mode at that time? Do you think that you needed to be, like, hospitalized? Were you in breakdown no. mode? No. If they had given me, like, even two days, I would have gotten up, gone to the video shoot, and made the video. Now, that's not to say that... That's what I said though, right? That's what the lady just rest is. That's why she went to her mama's house. Like, this is supposed to be my little getaway. Let me just chill, be with my family. I'm thinking I'm about to get, you know, just that rest and love that I need. Instead, the mama is not sent her even more over the edge. See, the difference in glitter would have been some huge sensation as opposed to what happened. Let's not forget it. it was September 11th, 2011. Yeah. It's 911 and it's 911 and it's a call that my mother made. And for the other little girls and little boys around the world who feel different who don't fit in who are struggling and also still don't lose their faith don't lose their connection to god because that's the place that i'm coming from and see that's why i always love mariah she always been spiritual you know what i'm saying i always love a person who recognizes again when you are feeling that imbalance, right? You got to get in touch with yourself. You got to get in touch with God. God, show me the way. You know what I mean? And um, this lady had to come a lot of adversity in her life. Um, and it's just the worst when you can't trust your own mama. Yo, it's crazy, crazy. You know, and it's hard sometimes with all the stuff that happens. And I feel like with the emancipation of Mimi, there was a re- energizing of just being centered spiritually and making that the top priority and i don't think many people understand why that's such a need for me but i think people who understand understand and that's the most important thing let's talk about your marriage whoa which one darling which which one <laughs> darling we gonna talk about the one I'm going to stop the interview here, guys. But, you know, we can pick up when she starts talking about the husbands. Um, if y'all want to continue this dialogue, again, I got the book on pre-order. So if y'all want to, you know, have like a little book club, little chapter review, we can do that too. In just, what, like 30 minutes, I learned so much about Mariah that, I mean, I didn't even know. And again, just talking about like those family issues, colorism, racism, mother issues you know what i'm saying it's just it's just crazy and again this lady's been through a lot and um and i think as lambley like we always know you know what i'm saying we understand a lot of where she comes from and it's in her music and like she always said like music has saved my life i always believed her when she said that and this proves it even more it's kind of like Yo, this lady been through a lot and super excited to get this book. Um, me and Mariah Carey, man, because again, this lady has been through a lot. But not only that, again, she's always been a great songwriter. I respect her pen game. So I know, again, she didn't like write every word in the book, but I can just imagine the storytelling. It's going to be a lot of laughing, a lot of crying, a lot of WTF moments. <laughs> but again, yeah, let's let's keep it going. Um, you know, we could do that. Drop some comments. Let me know what you guys think. Yeah, guys. So I'll see you guys next time. Hey, guys. If you're into reading, be sure to check out my books on Amazon. They're in paperback and ebook formats.